Hola friends, Maribel here with Liberation Pathways from the lands of the Paiute, Wasco, and Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs in what is now Central Oregon. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm excited to be doing this for the very first time and I'm seeing some some folks joining, uh, some dear friends and some new people that I am connecting with in this beautiful journey um, that is Liberation Pathway. So thank you for joining. Um, today I want to talk about the ancestral ways of knowing in working with the magic mushrooms, those niñitos santos as they are dearly called in the Mazatec culture in Mexico. So I have five points that I wanna go over um, and I'm gonna try to be very succinct in speaking to a very wide topic. Um, first of all, I want to honor the teachers. I want to honor the ancestors. I want to honor all the beings, plant, earth medicine, all the beings that have brought me to this point in my journey where I could be sharing this with you. Um, I am currently learning from a Mayan Toltec abuelo. His name is Carlos Jesus Castillejos and he can be found on Google if you speak Spanish. Uh, he has amazing resources, uh, writings, uh, YouTube videos, all kinds of resources that you can access for free. And every single word that comes out of his mouth is pure medicine. Um, so I highly, highly recommend um, checking him out if you speak Spanish. And if you have somebody who speaks Spanish and can translate, I also highly recommend. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the facilitators who coordinated this class for us to learn from um, this abuelo, uh, Ana Paula Suarez, Alejandro Cerdo, and I also want to thank my friend Michelle Erickson who invited me uh, into this class um, that is facilitated by this group of these group of people that she knows. So um, just a lot of thank yous and now um, to get down to what you came for uh, that I would like to share with you. So it's very exciting that the magic mushrooms, that the earth medicines are finally being recognized for their therapeutic value, for their ability to heal us in a deeper way. Um, I've been working with plant medicines for a very, very long time, particularly ayahuasca and chacruna. And I feel like every time I sit with these medicines, I have like 10 years of therapy in one in one sitting. So um, they're very, very powerful, um, the medicines. And I am really glad that they're finally being recognized by the medical industrial complex. However, there are certain things that um, I do think that we really need to observe as we move in this direction with these medicines, uh, which I will talk about here. Um, so First of all, I would like to start by honoring Maria Sabina. Maria Sabina was a Mazatec curandera from Mexico. Um, a lot of you know who she was. Um, and feel free to put your comments or anything um, that comes to mind as, as we go along in this conversation. Um, but uh, Maria Sabina was a Mazatec curandera. She and her family had been working with Los Niñitos Santos for thousands of years. The Ninito spoke directly with her, um, to her, um, and she was able to heal people uh, by having them consume Los Niñitos. Um, and so Maria Sabina was approached by a European ethno um, mycologist who was also a banker. His name was uh, R. Gordon Wasson, and he came with his wife to the village where Maria Savina lived and kind of cajoled his way into allowing her to sit in ceremony. So he um, told her that his son was missing, his son was lost and that he needed information on about his son and she allowed him to sit. It was a lie, it wasn't true. 
Um, and so he sat with the medicines and he took some niñitos back to Europe and people started finding out about los niñitos and uh, took the niñitos back to the lab um, and started uh, tinkering with psilocybin. And so eventually there was a big article written in Life magazine. This was like in the late 50s. And Maria Sabina's village got flooded by Europeans and white folks from the United States who wanted to know more about Los Niñitos Santos. And so the people that were coming in were coming out of curiosity. Uh, they wanted to experience altered states. You know, LSD was already in the works, you know, so everybody wanted to experience altered states. Everybody wanted to see God. You know, everybody wanted to to see beautiful, you know, psychedelic images and, you know, all of that. And so Maria Savina was very clear that you were only supposed to sit with los niñitos if you were coming to heal something, right? And so she allowed these people to sit. And when Maria Savina died, and before she died, she said that she regretted sharing these medicines with these people because los niñitos never spoke to her in the same way again because they were misused by the people, right? And so this is very, very important to remember because we're gonna come back to this. The medicines were misused by the people. They were never the same, according to this curandera who had been working with the medicines for thousands of years, right? Well, not, not her for thousands of years, but her family, right? Um, her people, right? So we're gonna come back to this. Um, and so, that is the first point I wanted to share with you, was this Maria Savina, um, a little bit of the history with Maria Savina, and there's a lot more. She was a poet, um, just amazing, amazing human being. She didn't read or write, and yet she wrote <laughs> amazing poetry. She recited amazing poetry and songs and all of that. So um, feel free to look her up if you don't know about her already. Um, and so the second point that I want to make is about the nature of sacred plant medicines, right? So we come from a culture where we tend to see everything as an object, right? The lettuce in our plate, the, the apple that we're eating, the chicken, you know, whatever it is that, that we're consuming, we tend to see everything as an object. And we go outside, we might see a tree. I mean, not, not all of us, obviously. Some of us are really, you know, practicing being in tune with nature in a different way and understanding that everyone is alive around us, right? Um, uh, the the Mazatec the the Toltec abuelo would say even your phone and your computer are alive right just a conglomerate of molecules and energy just swirling around um, everything is alive and so the plant medicines are entities right so when we look at ayahuasca for example she is a mother she is a great divine mother some people consider her a grandmother. Right? When we're talking about tobacco, right? Tobacco is a grandfather. He protects, he grounds, right? Um, when we're looking at uh, peyote, grandfather as well, right? When we're looking at um, los niñitos, los niñitos are holy children. They're very sensitive, playful, um, powerful um, beings that come from this miraculous source of earth, right? They're not here one day and here the next. Uh, they come from the rain, they come from the thunder, they come in the darkness, right? They, they are these, these miraculous, miraculous beings. So that is a second point. The nature of plant medicines is that they are all entities, they are all beings, and this is important for what's coming next. Right, so in our culture, right, according to this abuelo, we turn, tend to particularize everything. We separate things. We are not uh, really totally in tune with the fact that everything is interconnected and that we can't just break things apart, right? And so when we are looking at the idea of psilocybin therapy, 
right? Psilocybin. We're already looking at taking los niñitos into a laboratory, right? Run by Big Pharma. And we are looking at separating them from the psilocybin, right? Which automatically, not in keeping with the ancestral teachings, not in keeping at all with the ancestral teachings, right? So we're going to come back to this, right? Because the facil in the facilitator training, they're trying to be culturally responsive, re responsible, right? They're trying to honor um, the ancestral ways of knowing. But automatically, when we're including big pharma into this equation, we're already going into that particularizing thing that we do. Right. And another thing about our relationship with sacred plants is that we like the foreigners that came to work with Maria Sabina. A lot of the time we go into the consumption of sacred plants for fun, uh, for curiosity. Right. We can um, smoke cannabis and watch some Netflix or, you know, and, and, and no judgment on anybody. Right. I, I've been there myself. I've had a lot of fun with magic mushrooms um, in, in my day. But, you know, when we're really looking at ancestral ways of knowing, we're looking at a relationship with plants that has to be sacred, that has to be ceremonial if we are really going to honor the ancestral ways of knowing and if we're really going to have all the benefits that the plants and the earth medicines have for us, right? We have to approach them with that respect. Um, so that is the third point. I wanted to talk about our culture's relationship to sacred plants. Um, so the fourth point I would like to make is about the cultivation, the harvesting, the preparation and the administration even in a therapeutic setting of los niñitos, right? So again, we can't cover all of this in an Instagram live, right? But it is very important that there is ceremony in the way that they are grown, if they're gonna be grown and not harvested in the wild. Even if they're harvested in the wild, there is ceremony in the way that they are harvested. There is ritual in the way that they are prepared, right? And they are prepared whole and administered whole. They are not administered in a capsule as psilocybin. That is automatically not in keeping with the ancestral knowing, right? So um, the next point I want to make is about big pharma. Right. So Big Pharma is going to be working with these medicines. Right. Big Pharma is going to be taking these medicines into a lab. Right. So think about water. Right. Think about what water companies are doing with our bottled water. Right. They are going in and they are claiming springs and they are claiming natural water sources for their own, and they are bottling our water and selling it back to us in plastic bottles. And we have to pay for that, right? And the people don't have access to their water sources in, in many countries, right? And so the earth medicines are our heritage. They are our, our right. The earth gives these medicines to us freely Right. And of course, we have to be respectful of them. But right now, what we're looking at is billions of dollars already being publicly traded in the markets for the psilocybin industry. Right. And so I want to bring us back to what Maria Sabina said, that the Ninitos will never speak to her in the same way again because of misuse. So what happens, what happens when we bring the niñitos into laboratories and mass produce psilocybin and put big ticket prices on it and make it not accessible to the people, right? Because I make these beautiful tinctures that the abuelo taught me how to make, which will not be legal because they're not psilocybin 
produced by big pharma, right? So this is really, really, really important to note that as we move forward, we have to more than more than the focus on, you know, yay, we're moving forward and that they're going to be allowed for therapeutic use. But now when capitalism comes in, when the corporations come in, we're going to have a bigger battle in that we're going to be fighting lots of money in order to have access to our rights as human beings in this planet. Right. So this is really, 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 really important um, that the mushrooms can't need to be administered whole. Right. Um, and that we don't need a middleman in that way. We might need a facilitator. We might need somebody who, to guide us and to sit with us and to be there with us. But we do not need big pharma. We do not need a middleman for earth medicines, people. And so the, the goal is to decriminalize nature. As my dear friend Raquel O'Leary introduced me to this movement that's happening in California now, right? Decriminalize nature um, beyond allowing psilocybin for therapeutic use, right? So this is the other point I wanted to make. And so finally, I wanna talk about facilitator training, right? So the Oregon Health Authority is already, they rolled out their curriculum for facilitator training. And they are saying that there aren't enough indigenous, there aren't indigenous voices at the table and they've been looking in the Oregon region and, and trying to get indigenous representation. And what they're missing is that the indigenous voices are in Mexico, where the medicines come from, right? So once again, they're lumping all indigenous people together into one group. Like they all know the same things. They all practice the same things. They all know, right? These medicines were actually stolen from Mexico. So why not ask those indigenous teachers over there what they think about their facilitator training protocol, right? Um, and so those are the voices that need to be at the table. Right in honoring ancestral ways of knowing and honoring ancestral ways of truly working with these medicines in integrity. So that is another point I want to make. And so there's a lot of good things about the facilitator training. They're trying to cover their multi multicultural competency and their ethics and, you know, all of those things that are necessary and the history. They even they even mention Maria Sabina. Right. But you're mentioning Maria Sabina, and at the same time, you're saying that we need to work with big pharma in order to heal people. And that is not true, right? So it doesn't matter if you name Maria Sabina in your training, if Maria Sabina couldn't sit here right now and provide the healing the way she would do it, then what is the point of mentioning Maria Sabina in your training just to check a box that you did it? So this is really, 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 really important too, right? And so when we look at facilitator training for working with los niñitos, what we're looking at is we're looking at a facilitator who is actually honoring the medicines honoring the ancestral ways of harvesting, of growing, of administering the medicine. We're looking at a facilitator who has built a relationship with the medicines, right? So the abuelo says this, when the facilitator comes into the room and the facilitator has built a relationship with the medicine, the facilitator becomes the medicine in the room. The medicine doesn't even need to be present, right? So if you have your microdose there or you have your little mushrooms there and you give them to the person, it's more so that there could be a tangible symbol that the medicine is there. But really, the medicine is going to be there if the facilitator has built the relationship with the medicines, right? And so a true facilitator training is not going to be 160 hours long. It's not going to be 200 hours right? A true facilitator training is going to be a spiritual path. It will be a choice to walk, 
to walk in this way with these medicines in an intimate, respectful, beautiful, sacred way. So the good news is we're all invited. We're all invited to this table. We're all invited to partake and to commune with these medicines in this sacred way, right? And we don't really need a middleman and we really don't need permission in that way. So um, that's pretty much all I wanted to share with you today. And I am thinking that maybe we can start having an earth medicine series uh, that we can maybe do once a month. And if you're all up for it, um, I'd be down to share more information about specifics, about preparation, about singing, about all the ways that we honor the medicines and we walk this path together. Um, because we are not free until we are all free and we should all have access to this knowledge and we should all have access to this information because this is a beautiful way to live. Uh, so I'm really grateful again for the teachers. I am really grateful for the medicines and I'm really grateful for you all for joining. I'm so, so excited to see you. Um, a Spanish book. No, I, I named uh, Carlos Jesus Castillejos is the teacher that I'm learning from. He's a Toltec, a Mayan Toltec abuelo, and you can find his YouTube videos and writings and everything online. So just do a search for Carlos Jesus Castillejos and you will find videos of him speaking and uh, all kinds of gorgeousness because he's so rad, <laughs> so amazing. There are no words to describe. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, thank you so much for joining and I look forward to seeing you again. Um, and um, so grateful for you and this work that we're doing together. Much love. Bye.